I, I had a lot of letters this week. Thank you so much. But mainly from the people from Boardwalk Meander. They were very upset that I let, left Silver Lakes out last week. So I will include Silver Lakes in my preaching today because I'd hate to exclude anybody of importance in this particular organization. And we have two poster boys. If you've got the microphone, please, Adrian. We have two poster boys to this whole series on the Holy Spirit. One is Chris and one is Giovanni. And uh, why don't our poster boys on the Holy Spirit come up here quickly and um, tell us what happened this week. Are you here, Giovanni? Yeah, come quickly, my mate. Yeah, yeah, we knew you'd be sitting there. <laughs> okay, no more letters, guys. I've won enough for one week. Good morning, my mate. I'm unbelievably well. Very proud of you. Thank you. But I want to tell you what happened because this thing has to outwork itself some way. So you can for us an Afrikaans vertel wat die week gebeur het, my mate. Sê vir ons. We can talk English as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let's do this. Okay, let's do this. Okay. Good morning, 3CI. It's <laughs> nice seeing you all. What a privilege being here. We had the privilege of inviting Giovanni to our school. And, um, and before we started... Um, him and three very big oaks, bigger <laughs> than him, came in. Um, my disciplinary coordinator said, he's <laughs> moeilijk uit, meneer. <laughs> because they started off where, where the kids gathered on our vierkant, and they started praying there. And ons dacht, oeg, die hell is los, hier so, hier is moeilijk uit. And the kids started gathering, and everybody started getting excited, and they came to my office, and... And he said, Meneer, this is my first time that I have to talk. I was bang, what do I say, what do I say? I said, you know what, Giovanni, let the Holy Spirit see you just lie. And that's what you do feel, let it just go. And um, he started with the kids now, that was a big roar, you know, everybody was excited. And he's got, you have 1,020 new followers on Instagram. <laughs> Unbelievable. Um, all the kids were going like, yeah. and um, I come to tell his story. He started telling his whole story, and you know, the biggest uh, compliment I can give this young man for the first time that he spoke was if kids are vested in you, they are quiet. 2,000 kids were sitting there and they were silent. Maki Sak, who Giovanni. Voel het maar, ek moet nou anders praat nie. Amal was stil. And they wanted to hear his story. And he said to them, there is hope. How kids want to know that there is hope. And he started and he stopped. And he said, I started this wrong. Can I pray? And the whole school stood up, took one another, and he prayed for the school. And the Holy Spirit filled this man. And I'm saying, the kids are already asking, why come Giovanni here? <laughs> so for a first timer, he did well. Um, I, th I think, um, in all due fairness to you, Rory, I think you've got competition. <laughs> this man is on a mission, saving lives. So, Giovanni, I will for you, say by a donkey. What the voorrecht, you know, I said in front of the kids, um, Die ou ek, so gesit nie, jy kan nie met die kinders praat nie, blijf yeah. weg. <laughs> and um, as he talked, out of his heart, and, and the kids wanted to know the tattoos, they want to know the story, and um, they were in awe of this young man's path with God, where he met God in the cells, and I want to applaud you, um, want jy het vir die kinders gesê, maak die saak hoe donker dit is nie, jy kan nog steeds opstaan en een verskil maak, so vir ochend eer ek jou, Giovanni, want jy het in 2000 kinders levens ongelooflike verskil gemaakt, en ek weet die heren het nog groot plan met jou, jongman, so van wat ek loof, van my kant af, ons eer jou, jy weet, as jy er die life uit moet klim, kyk ek op, want ek denk die heren is rarig bezig om dier jou met kinders te werk, well done. Beautiful, bad. Take it, Giovanni. Speak. Pray. 
Steady, Chris. Hi, guys. Um, you're so my only thing I can say about it was on Monday. Um, you know, it was lucky for me to to first of all to to have a platform to 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 share my story in the best way I know, and that's through Jesus. That was very lucky. Um, so I want to say thank you for that. Um, and the other thing is, uh, you know, it was it was nice to see everyone. Everyone has a sad story. Um, everyone in life has a sad story. Um, but it was lucky for me to to, in a sense, use that story through. If I can tell you guys, I don't know if it makes any sense, but I don't even re- remember what I spoke about on Monday. It was like like word vomit. Um, I know before. Before I was praying, I'm like, yes, he says, I should believe help my need, I don't want him to say any. And when I was speaking there, it was just like, Bleh, the whole time. <laughs> so that was nice. And um, we actually have, yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a girl here today that actually joined from Worship of Watercliffe. She came specially. So um, I'm happy, very happy about that. I'm just, I'm, I'm just grateful for, for the way that. Like, I've, I haven't been doing anything. And that's, uh, I've, I've been sitting back for the first time in my life. I've actually taken a step back and everything's just been falling into place and everything's just been working out. And, and it's like, it's, it's hard to explain, but it's, it's, it's worked out before I've even wanted it to work out. Um, so, yeah, that's very really like, and just thank you for the opportunity. And yeah, let's pray quickly. It says, okay, okay, go slowly work. Jesus, I say thank you that we are here today by each other. Jesus, and I say thank you that 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 you make me use it as an instrument om, om to lay under His name. I say also thank you for for the heart that we fill. And and I know that for us, the only thing that is on my heart is Jesus is is to hand out to stretch and and thank you to say for the good that we see from you and the good that we miss, and the good that we all have forgotten. Jesus, and most of all, thank you for die die ons ons kopies wat u oorvul met u se liefde. Ehm um, dis iets wat by niks anders kom nie en ek sê nie dankie daarvoor. Amen. Amen. Thank you. I just wanted to say voor jy loop while you are speaking he said to the kids um meneer jy gaan kwaad vir my wees. Hy sê vir die kinders kry tattoos op jylle gezicht. <laughs> and everybody started clapping. So, <laughs> so we'll get in tattoos on our faces. Giovanni weer eens vir jou, kwartier jou hoor. Dank jy, Chris. So, so why are we doing this? Because there are two men from completely different backgrounds and God has put them together in the same church and now they're using each other's influence to influence people for Jesus. Mr. Headmaster, I'm very concerned because six weeks ago you would never have worn a short shirt to church. That's so. Uh, the, the tattoos are coming next, my brother. <laughs> uh, this week somebody sent me a picture of a lady speaking in um, Barcelona University. That's Beatrice. She normally sits about on the third row over there. And one Sunday we spoke about her. And uh, this week she's speaking in Barcelona in the university. You can turn it off. And yeah, let's say thank you to God. I don't know if Leslie and Sanet Tiat are here. Are they here this morning? Are you there? Why don't you stand? Why don't you stand? So so there they stand and 15 rows back, being part of this church. And uh, Sanet invited me to speak. She's the Wolf Bestieder van een van die groot um, aardappel maatskapie in die land, en sy het my gevra om met hy 500 mense te kom praat, en so we've got a, we've got a lady, and, and then I used a scripture that actually Leslie and, and, and Sinet used in a testimony, she had cancer 10 years ago, and God gave her a scripture which I used at the conference, and so somehow God is using headmasters and, and tattoo artists and uh, lecturers in Barcelona and heads of agricultural companies and putting us all together. And together we are forming one. And when the, when, the, when the angels look down from heaven, they see what God is busy doing. I, I, I got quite a few letters saying, why, why are you attacking culture? I'm not attacking culture in, in the slightest. You've got to understand that a monoculture church is not a victory for the kingdom of God. Whether it be black or English. 
It is not a victory for God. The victory for God is when a multicultural church starts to function in equality. While, while I'm standing here and I'm dismantling the power that pastors carry in the city saying, I don't preach from the platform and I don't preach with the title, while I'm degrading myself to my rightful position in your eyes and I'm a saint just like you, don't feel like I'm attacking your culture. There's only one way that we'll ever find unity, it's at the foot of the cross. So Rory, what do you think about Heritage Day? Do you know the problem with Heritage Day is that you put on the clothes that define your heritage would exclude me from your culture where actually everything we preach in this church is to break that down. You say, but culture is important. Culture is learned. It's not in the genetics. Culture is learned. It's not in genetics. And you can look at any form of, it is in the genetics. If I got born in Australia, mate, with this body, mate, I'll be speaking different, mate. The only culture that is inside of our DNA is the desire to worship God. And we will use that in any way, but depending on the families we grow up in and the experiences we go through, we will use that in any way. And we end up worshiping something, whether it's cars or money or marriage or sex, we'll worship something because we're designed to worship. It is the only thing inside of us. And we have to be careful in the outworking, and obviously we have preferences. You, you, you know that. If you grew up with curry, you, you'll prefer that to a bright place. We understand that. But you have to make sure that that which is your preference does not stop the kingdom of God coming in your life. Because these two men, while we keep putting them up, they have got nothing in common other than Christ. Nothing in common other than Christ. And six weeks ago, that young man would never have preached at Vardacliff High School other than the Spirit of God baptizing those two men in that same pool. And that's all they have in common. And little bit by little bit, we work it out, friends. And I know it's tough. Please understand this. Offense is not given. Offense is taken. It's taken. And while you are, God is busy dealing, because we are all under process. While God is busy dealing, with, let us go back to the Scriptures so that we can actually build a little bit of heaven on earth. And look, we're not perfect. We have got glaring weaknesses and faults. But we are trying to aim to have a little bit of what it looks like. For men and women to serve one another, lay down their lives, not draw attention, not needing to be famous, not manipulating people, dominating people. Amen? Amen. And so we're looking through the, the book of Acts and we're looking at Peter who's got issues and we're looking at Cornelius who's got issues. And, and Peter says, surely not, Lord. I mean, he, he gets this picture of God and because of his cultural upbringing, he's like, there's no ways that I will ever be able to eat a hippopotamus or a hoopoo. It'll never happen. And I shared last Sunday night, I didn't share in the morning because I forgot, I walked away from my notes, but I've never had alcohol in my life. And there's a number of reasons why I've not done that, but none of them are religious reasons. I just thought with this particular makeup, alcohol wouldn't suit me. <laughs> Can you imagine? Either I would have got hurt or somebody else would have got hurt. So I decided not to drink. I'm 54 years old. I go to Aidan Antoinette's church. We preach there. There's a man who owns a wine estate. He doesn't know Jesus. He's, he's spent 10 years developing his brand of wines and he invites us to lunch and his wife is an architect who's doing the building. She's got radically saved in Stellenbosch. So from this church plant in Stellenbosch, one woman gets saved. Her husband is a Ukrainian and uh, he doesn't know Jesus and he invites us for lunch. And we go to a fine dining lunch and the sommelier comes there and he says, uh, this particular wine has got roots that go through the clay into the granite and through the granite and they start pulling the musk out of the soil. I'm thinking, dear God, but in my Bible I'm reading, surely not, Lord. I have never, I have never. And he thinks, now, China, you're going to have to start your drinking career, otherwise this Ukrainian thinks you're nuts. So I'm sitting here thinking, yes, no, yes, no, Jesus, but God, church, the Bible, what? And I'm thinking, really? Musky, hey? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Amazing. You say 10 years old from the oak. Yes, I, I, can, I can smell the oak. Yeah, it's incredible. 
<laughs> I never knew what cat weed tasted like. I have no idea why any of you would drink. But we went through a whole list and we ended with grappa. If you don't know what grappa is, it's wine on steroids, Jana. It is crystal clear. It's in an Argentinian bottle. It's on a 1500 and he tuned, hey, Rory, the highlight is the grappa. I'm thinking, grappa, Jana. I smell that grappa, my nose hairs retreat. So then, shoo. My earlobes go warm. My heart rate goes up. And I look at how he does it. He just tunes, Surely not, Lord. I have never allowed alcohol. But God has shown me that this man who doesn't know Jesus actually needs to somehow connect with you who are in the church to know that. And because you have this stance, it's going to block him. I'm not telling you to drink. I'm just telling you God told me to drink. And as I sipped that grappa, my eyes started watering, my tongue started burning. I thought, have you got milk? Can I show you a picture of that man, unsaved man, who owns a wine estate? Can I show you a picture of him last week? Put it on the main screen, please. Just here. Just here. He said, just here. This is my friend Annette. She says, sit right here. My God, that is who you are. Imagine if I said, I don't drink. Well, I hope I don't drink much more. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't imagine why you would keep drinking that stuff. But the point is this, friends. What have you been doing for 54 years that might stop the kingdom of God coming? I'm not saying he came here because I drank. But I know this. I never caused an obstacle in his way. While he was trying to show me the 10 years of his labor, in that experience... We somehow had a connection that Aidan and Antoinette have had with him over the while that has led to his wife designing their new building. And he said to his wife, we have to somehow find out how our wine farm can finance the building that they're going into. After Is that true, Adrian? You see, friends, so God is showing us things that sometimes are culturally become standards and stock things that, that stop us moving forward. And we've got... Sanet and we've got Beatrice and we've got Chris and we've got Giovanni and we've got the people next to each other. Amen? It's nice to see you. Let's read Acts chapter 10. We say, while you're saying these words, the Holy Spirit came, let's look at these words. And verse 34, for time's sake, it says, Then Peter began to speak, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism. Say, God does not show favoritism. But he accepts men from every nation who fear him and do what is right. You, you know the message that God sent to the people of Israel, telling them the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. Say Lord of all. Lord of all. So we're saying that there's some conversations that attract God, and there's some conversations that repel God. You know that what has happened throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. Say Nazareth. So you can put whatever town that you grew up in there. My town is Swinburne. That's outside Harry Smith, next to Van Rienen. And the reason why I put Nazareth there, because the Bible says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Can anything good come out of Giovanni's story? If God can anoint Jesus of Nazareth, then you know that he can anoint Rory of Swinburne. And if you're Bertie from Bob Sontane, he can anoint you too. And if you're Joe from Johannesburg or Debbie from Durban, he can anoint you too. And you don't have to go through Bible school and you don't have to get a degree in theology. You just have to believe Jesus. And when he anoints you, you start to change people's lives because the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And so whether you're a Sanhetia, I was so proud of this lady. She's in a man's world of farming. 500 farmers or 300 or 400 farmers in the, in the leaders of their organization. And I'm sitting next to a member of our church who's actually the boss of this event. And I thought, she is full of God. She is full of God. 
And we have to make sure, friends, that when we come to church, this is not the pinnacle of Christianity, some guy preaching. You are the pinnacle of Christianity. You have been placed in the financial or agricultural or wine world, and God's Spirit is upon you. And in that place, you start to make decisions, and you break culture, and you bring freedom. Amen? You are priests. And that's what I try to break. Oh, pastor, will you pray for me? You don't need me. You've got Jesus. He breaks all the religious nonsense and He gets you into the presence of God. He fills you with the power of the Holy Spirit. He anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. You see, friends, up until that time, all the anointing was done through ceremonial stuff. And people have got smoking handbags and still in the church, we've got all these smoking handbags. We've got all this symbolism. And, and you say, Rory, it's symbolism that was finished by Christ. And the priests were anointed, they would take acacia and they would put all these herbs and spices together and they'd mix them all up and they'd put oil in them and then they would anoint them, friends. Jesus saying, all that symbolic, systematic nonsense is finished. I will anoint you with my Holy Spirit. We don't have to go through the religious practices in order to function as Spirit-filled believers. And people do all sorts of things. They take oil and they go and rub it on buildings. They would just say, what are you doing? Say, we're anointing with oil. I said, don't waste your time. It is a religious practice that has been bypassed by the finished work of Christ. Please, friends, that's what I'm fighting for. I'm fighting for a freedom so that we can come out of the practices that hold us captive. Amen? We have got access to God. You are spirit-filled. My family stand here, my whole family. And these two ladies, please, those two, could you stand? Susan and Lise. Come stand here. Not boasting about my family. One guy wrote me a letter this week and he said, and I said, listen, my mate, I can tell you this. I've served God with English people and I've served God with Afrikaans people. 15 years there, 10 years here, I would choose Afrikaans people 100 times out of 100. He said, will you say that on Sunday? I said, yes. So I'm saying it. (laughs) When we came here, he was five, he was eight, she was 14 and single, and he was 16. And this church has been good to us. And you know how we landed? We parked our car. Our, bus, our, our, our truck arrived, and it just so happened. It just so happened, as God designed it. Ons bierman en biervrouwe was die van de Vesta en familie. Van de Vesta is in familie. Them. And they walked around the corner with crumpets and with syrup and with tea, and they said, welcome na Pretoria too. And she was worshiping on the stage today. And I think God had a plan 10 years ago to put us into this community with this beautiful people. If I said to you that day, you were probably 14 years old, not younger, you would have been 12 years old, 11 years old. If I said to you one day, Lisa, you and I are going to do church together, you're going to worship and I'm going to preach, you would say, Oom, ek weet nie waarvan jy praat nie. But the Lord is busy. He's busy. And I want to say thank you because Pretoria has been good to us. He's been very, very good to us. Now she's married. Now he's working at Durban. We seldom get together. But this weekend we had together. And I want to say thank you for being kind to us over all these years. You can be seated. The Holy Spirit and power. The Holy Spirit, not oil and and bags and smoke and funny clothes. You see, somehow we put all these things around it, friends, and then we think, that's got power. Or I must go through the, no, you've got power. Rory of Swinburne has got power. Debbie from Dahlstrom, you've got power. Manny from Malachrene, you've got power. And how he went around doing good and healing all those who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. 
We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a tree. Say tree. tree. But God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. That's what Adrian spoke about. He's alive. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen. By us who ate and drank with him, and after he rose from the dead, he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and dead. Say judge. It says, while he was speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came upon him. Say judge. judge. When you speak about judge, what do you think? Do you think God's going to come closer or go further away? Of course we think he's going to go further away. God's judgment. Phew! If I talk to you about Jacob Zuma, how do you feel? I think he's got to face his day in court. Why? Because God is just. It doesn't matter if he's free or not free, but we're all sitting at 10 years later saying, Jacob Zuma has to have his day in court. Why? Because we represent God. We are men, we've got justice in our hearts. And until he faces a judgment, South Africa will not be happy. It's exactly the same, friends. That same justice that feels it's unfair for Jacob Zuma is the justice that God put inside of our hearts. And when we speak about God's judgment, it actually attracts the Holy Spirit, not repels the Holy Spirit. God is a judge. He is going to judge me. He deserves to judge me. I've broken his commandments. I believe in Jesus. He takes my punishment and I live under his grace. All the prophets testify about him. Everyone believes in him. All the prophets testify that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. So he's talking about all these incredible things. And the next verse says, while Peter was still speaking these words, say these words, words. the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. Let's just talk about these words for a few seconds. The first one is this, God shows no favoritism. There's Peter, he's an apostle, he's a bigot, He's over-religious. He's been in the church too long. He's got too many traditions that stop us getting to God. And you've got Cornelius, who's a seeker. He's not a Christian, but he's praying and he's giving some money away. This guy is a Jew. This guy is a Gentile. This guy, Paul, later on we read about him as a scholar. This guy is a soldier. And the Bible says there is no favoritism. And when we actually build a church with no favoritism, stop defending your culture. When we build a church with no favoritism based on social or cultural or educational upbringing, it becomes attractive to God. Where we celebrate everybody. And you say, stop nailing the rich. I'm not nailing the rich. I'm nailing the thing that stops us from including people that society would exclude. And when we build that group of people on earth, there will be no choice but the Spirit of God to rush in. And the reason why I put Beatrice up there and Sinet up there is because God works with men and He works with women in potato conferences and in universities in Barcelona and in schools in Vartekloof. And this is just half time. This is where you eat the orange and take a sip of water and go back into your office tomorrow full of the power of God. And it said, and they preached the message of peace. Say peace. peace. How many of you are really at peace, friends? Seriously. You know what it says in Ephesians? We don't have time to look at Ephesians. But it says this. He has broken down. You can put it on the board. You can read. He has broken down the dividing wall of hostility. He has broken the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. When we grow up, friends, every one of us have got preferences And any preference that is different to ours, we fight against. He has pulled the wall down and he has made peace. He has taken what it says in Ephesians 2. He has taken two men and he's made them one. He has taken Chris from Vatacliff and Giovanni and he's made them one. While we sit here, friends, although it's an unbelievable celebration of unity, it is a prophetic reminder to us that God will not settle until we are at peace with everybody even if they're not at peace with us. The Bible says, as far as it depends on you, make peace with all men. Romans chapter five says, I have peace with God. 
And so I don't live with a guilty conscience. I don't live with shame. I don't live with condemnation. Because I have peace with God. I have peace with my brothers. And you know the most important thing? I have peace in my own soul. The Hebrew word is shalom. It's a wholeness. It's a wellness. If you messed up your parenting and your kids have left the church and they're not serving God and they're drug addicts locked up in Barcelona somewhere or in Los Angeles, friends, Jesus can give you peace now. All your faults, all your mistakes, all your disappointments, all your stupid decisions. I did a wedding yesterday. 80 years of marriage between the parents, daughter divorced. 80 years of marriage between two sets of parents, 50 years and 30 years. And we've got to celebrate that. But she also has to come into peace through her divorce. Otherwise, it's but we've stayed married for our whole lives. Friends, there's such high standards that nobody can ever match. That's why we need the gospel of peace, that we can settle where we have fallen short and that thing which causes agony and, 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 and tension in my heart can be laid to rest. May I say to you today, 3CI, Shalom. 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 Come into peace. You know, the, you know those things, 5, 15, 20 minutes? Sometimes people come into my office and say, if I could just take that 20 minutes of my life out, that 20 minutes has defined me, that 20 minutes of stupidity, if I could just take shalom. Shalom. He comes in. Amen? Galatians chapter 3. If you can just put it on the board, please. I'll be about six more minutes. You see, if you read Acts and you think, well, he hung on a tree, what does that actually mean? Let's sort of see what it says in, in chapter 30, uh, Galatians 3. Christ redeemed us from the curse. Say curse. curse. That's where we get our word cuss from. The same word as you, you, you cussing. So your teacher says you don't cuss. It comes from curse. So if I spoke to you, this is a very godly woman. She's a very godly. What, what would you like me to speak to you? Blessing or curse? Blessing. blessing. If I spoke to you, what would you like? Blessing or curse? Of course, this is his friend Stain, whose dad passed away this week. They got saved together as 18-year-old boys. They've served God ever since. Stain lives in America. His dad died this week. What, what would you like, Stain? Would you like cursing or blessing? But sometimes when we drive in our cars, friends, sometimes when we sit around as families, we are cussing. Sure. Criticism is like a cussing. Look what it says. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given, say blessing. Blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Jesus Christ so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. You can turn it off. The curse is broken. Amen. When you start speaking about the broken curse and you start to speak about the blessing and you start to speak blessing, what happens? The Holy Spirit comes. The Holy Spirit comes. So learn how to bless, friends. This week I had my daughter in hospital, my wife in Durban, and a conference in Johannesburg. And I was late for my son's school run. And there was load shedding. And I just pray, Lord God, the greatest load shedding that ever happened was on the cross of Christ when you took my son, fix Eskim. Um, but thank you, Jesus, for carrying this deep weight, which is upon everybody's shoulders. And I saw a 200-meter gap in the traffic, and I took the gap, <laughs> down the wrong side of the road, and I pulled it in front of a 3CI guy. <laughs> I won't tell you his name, but his wife's name's Nolene. <laughs> I promise I won't tell you his name. His surname's Gosling. <laughs> yes, and he swore <laughs> to his sons. So I've taken him through repentance. I had to phone him, I said, Gaz, I'm so sorry, but my, my, my daughter's sick, my wife's at Durban, I need to get to a conference because Sanette sent me emails to say, if you're late, um, we're going to fire you. 
But, but, but why don't you try this week, blessing instead of cursing? Just, just try it. You say, but Rory, this is, just try blessing instead of cursing. Just blessing. Bless you, Noah. Bless you, Kath. Bless you, Stephen. Bless you, Yanaman. Bless you, Jay. Bless you, Adele. Bless you, Wendells. Bless you. Thank God for you, Jan. I thank God that you can carry heavy loads. Thank God that you're probably the strongest man in the church. But actually, that's not the greatest load you carry. The load you carry is for the wholeness of people. Thank God for that, Jan. Thank God for that, Jan. Thank God, Jan, that I can see you pick up 72 kg dumbbells and swing them around. But thank you, too, that you can pick up people that have been addicted to cocaine for 10 years. Thank you for that, Jan. Thank you that while the whole office is closed on a Monday night, you come in here by yourself and you set up a meeting so that those who are addicted to substances can hear about Jesus. Thank you that every single time that you pick up a weight, you've got somebody's name written on it. Thank you that you've engraved Luke McIntosh's name, that boy suffering from a blood disorder in Durban, that every time you pick up that dumbbell, you pick up Jesus, uh, Luke McIntosh to Jesus. Thank you for that. Versus, hey, where were you? Yana, I didn't see you on Tuesday. Why weren't you there? What's happening? Thank you, Wendells, that actually when you lost your child, when Samuel died, and as a trained psychologist, you never knew how to get to the bottom of your pain, and you tried to even look in the mirror and counsel yourself and go to the top psychologist, but you actually are them. And so you had to do a PhD against the flow of your degree because you had to learn how faith could come into the healing process. And you sit here as a psychologist with a PhD because you realize that psychology is not the answer to people's pain. Jesus is the answer. God bless you as you counsel people this week. As they come into you with deep problems, that the pain you felt at the loss of your son did not take you out the church, did not make you bitter with God, but actually prepared you to counsel to others who have lost. Do you understand the blessing? And Lene, maybe no one's ever spoken to you about the, the time that you put into young children and the level of excellence that you have created in your educational institution so that children from a young age can have security and mobility and they can have an incredible destiny written over their lives. Thank you that you have sacrificed so deeply to build an institution of such high value so that people get a chance. And as you bless, friends, and as you bless, and as you bless, and as you bless, and as you bless, the presence of God just starts to pour in. You feel it? You know it? I think, what does this guy do? And that guy, this guy? This guy makes borehole digging machines. The most sophisticated machines. It's the most incredible thing. And I had the privilege of doing his dad's funeral. And then they sent one of their machines here. You remember Kula? And the machine came and it dug and we couldn't hit water. So his construction was go deeper. And we couldn't hit water. And he said, go deeper. And every meter you go deeper, it gets more expensive. And he said, you go deeper. And this guy said, I said, what's the instruction? He said, the instruction is we go until we hit the water. Every drop of water that is on this property comes from him. And them. And the machines that go deeper and deeper and deeper. You know what is sitting inside here? It's so beautiful. So beautiful. And I won't draw attention on this side, but Discovery's number one agent in the whole country is sitting in this room. Number one agent in the whole country sitting in this room. I had the privilege of doing their wedding. And we can go one to the next. Stop cursing, church. The world curses. The world cusses. Just bless. Find a reason to bless and bless. And there are a whole lot more reasons. I'll close with forgiveness. As I was praying and preparing, I was reminded of a friend of mine. I met him at the Sharks Rugby Academy. God can even work there. 
I was doing a breakfast for the Sharks where a Springbok rugby player said to me, what you preach about grace, and he said, it's better to obey God's law than it is to live a wild life. And I said, no, they're both wrong. He said, you are wrong. I said, no, you are wrong. I said, you are under God's law. You are not under God's grace. And I did it, and I went home, and a man phoned me. I won't tell you his name because he's passed away now. He became one of my best friends. He phoned me, and he said, hi, Roy, this is my name. I said, yes, sir. He, I said, what do you do? He said, I'm the senior partner of this company named after himself. I said, what's wrong, sir? He said, I need to come and see you. And he drove into my office impeccably dressed in a beautiful tailored suit with in those days an S500 Mercedes. He parked his car, he walked into my office and for four hours he just cried and cried and cried and cried. I never said a single word in four hours as this very impressive lawyer ahead of a massive company, just cried and cried about the mess of his life. And he said, what must I do? I said, you must fall on the mercy of Jesus and you must ask for forgiveness. And he went down onto his knees in his suit and he lifted up his hands and he said, Father, forgive me. And the presence of God just poured into my office. And little bit by little bit, he flew his kids back from London and from Cape Town. And we sat around in his lounge and we went through a process of forgiveness and God gripped their family. And he gave his life to Jesus and order came in and his marriage was restored. Sometimes marriages don't get restored, but his was. And forgiveness came. My wife was away this weekend, so there's not a lot to do but watch Joyce Meyer. What do you think of Joyce Meyer? Well, I mean, Joyce Meyer is Joyce Meyer. Eh? I think she's a remarkable woman. I think she's amazing. I don't agree with everything she says, but I, of course, I don't agree with a lot of things. But, but she started to preach, and I, I was there. It was 11. I couldn't sleep, and she started to speak, and she said, um, do you know that I was repeatedly sexually abused by my father? And I thought, Joyce, I never knew that. She started to speak a full auditorium. And she said, then God gripped my heart and he set me free and he taught me about grace. And then God said to me, your parents are not living to the standard that I want them to live by. So Joyce, I've blessed you. You must forgive your dad and you must buy him a house and they must end their lives in blessing. And she argued with God. And then you know what she said? She said, then I forgave my dad and I bought them a house and I blessed them. And I tell you, friends, at 11 o'clock on Wednesday night, I got on my knees. I just lifted my hands and I felt the presence of God just rush in. Why is Joyce Meyer so blessed? Why does she have a ministry all over the world? I can tell you this, because she forgave her father who did not deserve to be forgiven. He's a brute and a beast. But God forgave her and she forgave him. And when she forgave him, the Spirit of God hit her ministry. There are no favorites. The curse has been broken. Judgment will come, but Jesus has taken it. He can anoint ordinary people like Rory from Swinburne and Dan from Durban. And keep forgiving. And the Holy Spirit will keep flowing. In Jesus' name.